We proudly present the Disney Songbook and the beloved songs and music of Disney legends Richard M. Sherman and Alan Lincoln.
certain age, like, uh, <laughs> you had a, a crush on that, and I love those old Annette Fittichello record albums oh. that had themes, and, and they had the novelty songs on them, like, uh, what was it? Uh, I don't have a princess. I have a princess. Oh, yes, I have a princess. It's from an album which we worked on called uh, Hawaiian and One Word. Clever stuff. Hawaiian and, and actually, what we did was we, we wrote several songs and then we took some standards and made an album package. And it was a big, big seller. And I'll give you a little bit of Hawaiian and. Uh, no, the, 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 what was it? I have a princess. princess. That's it. I saw a boy on Oahu Island floating down the bay on a crocodile. He waved at me and he swam ashore, and I knew he'd be mine forevermore. Pineapple princess, he calls me pineapple princess all day as he plays the ukulele on the hill above the bay. Pineapple princess, I love you. Someday you're gonna marry and you'll be my pineapple queen. The next time we did it was a big hit, so they said, do another one. So we did an Italian themed album and it was called Italian Edge. <laughs> and then we did a third one about dance music. We did dance in it. And one day Annette said, what are you going to do next? Bassinet? <laughs> and uh, kiss, what was it? A kitchenette. She would go out of the house and then kitchen. But we didn't do any more of those. That was enough of them. When you got the kitchen at it, you have to end it. Yeah, you're over. Peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about another little uh, teenage idol that you've worked with. Her name was Haley Mills. Oh, okay. <laughs> And oh, the trouble with that was we've written some songs for a film called The Parent Trap. You might know. And uh, it was, uh, God knows, really a sequence where uh, Haley and Haley, the two Haley's, would sing a duet together called Let's Get Together. It was kind of a subtle, <laughs> uh, subtle hit for the parents to get together. They were a divorced, divorced family. So basically, we had this recording session. And Haley was very hesitant. She was very afraid about doing anything. And uh, I re realized that she was not happy. So I said, what's the matter here? And she said, well, I'm an actress. I'm not a singer. And I said, but you are a wonderful actress. Well, she said, thank you. I said, why don't you act like you're a singer? I can do that. I can do that. And she came out with a million seller. Oh, I really think you're swell. Thank you. 
road is a carousel of color. Delightful stories, 
with wonderful characters all about the stuffed teddy bear and his friends. And he wrote this for his little boy, Christopher Robin. And we had the great honor of being asked to write the music for that original Winnie the Pooh series. And so I'll play you uh, the title song, which I just love. Deep in the hundred acre wood where Christopher Robin plays, you'll find the enchanted neighborhood of Christopher's childhood days. A donkey named Eeyore is his friend and Kanga and Little Root. There's Rabbit and Piglet and there's Owl. But most of all, Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, Tubby little cubby all stuffed with fluff, he's Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, Cubby. Here's a break. 
Now, there was another film that you did that I know is one of your personal favorites, and that would be The Jungle Book. Oh, I know. <laughs> and recently, that film has been turned into a, a stage show, a, a highly acclaimed stage show. So oh, far. very exciting. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, actually, The Jungle Book was a, a great assignment because uh, see, Jim Berger Kipling, the great English author, had written a marvelous book called Jungle Book, and it was a very serious, dark story. It had a lot of mysterious things in it and grisly things that took place in the jungle. And Walt fell in love with the storyline, but he didn't like the tone, the attitude of it. And originally, there was a series of uh, an entire screenplay created for it, and Walt rejected it out of hand. He didn't like it, but he, he wanted to do the story. So he asked several of us to come into his office one morning, and I remember there was story men there with the uh, directors and background people and all, and then we, Bob and I were the songwriters on the staff, so we were there, of course. And he said, how many of you fellows uh, have read Roger Kipling's Jungle Book? And not a hand was raised. It was like being at school and you didn't do the assignment, you know? <laughs> you couldn't raise your hand. And he, he said, Great, I'm glad you didn't do that because I don't want you to read that book. I want to tell you the story. And, and he did, the greatest storyteller of the last century by far was Walt Disney himself. He told the story. He was. And he told, he told us that, that morning how he wanted to see Jungle Book. And he became the different characters. He became Baloo the Bear. He became the king of the, the apes. And he became all these wonderful characters. And all of a sudden, we were nuts about this story. We had to tell it right. And so, the one of the assignments, he said, take the scariest, grimmest story and have fun with it. Well, Richard, you know, one of the things that we talked about um, backstage, actually, you were, you were going on and on and on about how much you love the stage show, this new stage show with the Jungle Book. It's just wonderful. They're taking the score, the original score, plus Terry Gilkinson's song, which I always take bows for it, I didn't write, and that's the bare necessities. It's a great song, the one song we didn't write, the picture, but all the rest of the songs are Bob's and mine, and that score, plus the new additional songs that Bob and I had written for a sequel, plus a few other things, are fattened out into this big stage production, and it looks so great, it's a wonderful live cast, and I'm very excited about it, it'll be touring, I'm sure it'll be coming to the Denise. Well, we were talking, you, you kind of focused on the Vulture song, Oh, and yeah. it was one of your favorite songs in the film, and they do it in the play as well. Yeah, now they were assigned to do a, a song that uh, these vultures do. Vultures, they, they wait till something's dead, then they eat them, they, you know, they carry them. And uh, it's kind of a grisly thing, so we decided, let's not do that kind of vultures. We'll have friendly vultures. <laughs> we'll have vultures that want to be nice. And there's a little, a little entendre in it. We did it as a, as a barbershop quartet. So you've got to imagine a barbershop quartet with slightly Liverpudlian accents singing this thing. When you're alone, who comes around to pluck you up? When you are down, and when you're outside looking in, who's there to open the door? That's what friends are for, and who's always here to extend a friendly claw? That's what friends are for. And when we're lost in dire need, who's at your side? At lightning speed, we're friends with every creature coming down the pipe. In fact, we've never met an animal we didn't like. <laughs> didn't like, you got it. So you can see, we're friends in me, and friends in me are friends in me. Grunts, he goes, oh, 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 like that a lot. And uh, he also swings in a tree. 
And I remember sitting there, we were talking about what are we going to write for this guy? And as soon as the sword swings and the tree came out, he said, he's the king of the swingers. Not just the king of the he's the king of the swingers. And his marauding monkey friends, they're his, his band. So we, we really got the thing. And we cast it with Louis Prima and Sam Pantera and the witnesses, this great group of jazz men. And they were marvelous. And then Phil Harris played Baloo. And so we, we said, we'll have a sequence where Baloo and, and the King of the Apes sing together. And we never could get the two of them together. So that's, that's the story moment. So actually what happened was, uh, we recorded just Louis Prima and Sam and Tara filled in in one place where they're doing the sketch thing. And that's the double talk sound words. And the uh, scooby dooby doo booby by nasa that kind of thing. And we, we just did the, the aping of it. And then that was just scooby dooby doo scooby dooby doo And Phil Harris, about four months later, when he finally got into the studio, was listening to his, I can't sing that, that's not my kind of words. I can't do that. Woody Rockman, our director, came out and said, Phil, look, do what you want to do, but just answer, you know, to say, oh, I'll do that. And it became the most hilarious thing you've ever heard. So they're having a conversation in Double Talk. And I, I can't do all of that, but I'll give you an idea of what the song sounds like. Now, I'm the king of swimmers over the jungle of the ID. I reach the top and have to stop. And that's what's bothering me. Now, I'm going to be a man, man, coat, and stroll right into town. And be just like the other men. I'm tired of walking around and say, Ooh, I want to be like you. I want to walk like you. Talk like you too. You see me through. And eat like me. Then learn to be you. Way too. I'll eat no mannerisms. We'll be a certain No one will know where man comes. And the rabbit's angry is. And when I eat, I won't be alone with my feet, cause I'll become a man, man, cuz, and get stuck in your key. Say, ooh, 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 I wanna be like you, ooh, ooh. I wanna walk like you, and talk like you, too. You see me, shoo, 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 and eat like me, be, be, shoo, shoo, and learn to be human, too. And send it off to Chevalier. 
Sure enough, he came out of retirement and he sang the main title and the end title of the song in English and French. He was wonderful. My wife and I happened to be in Paris about three and a half, four months after he recorded the song. And we were just coming in the hotel and there he was. Maurice sent some people and I said, Maurice Richard Sherman, remember? Oh, yes, I remember you, of course. I said, well, my brother Bob and I are so thrilled that you did this recording and it sounds so great and everything. Everybody in the studio is excited about it. And he said, well, thank you. He said, I love, I love Walt Disney. And I did this for Walt Disney. And it's a very nice song. I said, well, thank you so much. And he said, I said, but there's one thing that bothers me. I, I did this terrible, thick, phony French accent on the album, on the record, and I apologize for that. He looked me right in the eyes and said, accent? I heard no accent. <laughs> You just said there. <laughs> well, now, ha how many of you grew up on the film Bed Knobs and Broomsticks? <laughs> there's, a, there's a song in that score that's very special to you. And tell us, and it was nominated for an Oscar. Well, tell us about it. Actually, uh, we were at the studio, and Walt had passed on. And we were, we were back. We had come back into the studio after being away for a while. And uh, we were asked to do uh, some more songs for Red Knot. They were about to shoot the film and they needed a couple of sequences. And there was one place where a song was needed for the heroine, uh, Edgar Time Price, and Edgar Time Price, to sing uh, about a little Doubting Thomas, a little boy who didn't believe in magic, he didn't believe in anything, he was very disenchanted with life. And uh, we were trying to think of what are we going to write about? And we were saying, Walt isn't here anymore, and we used to always bounce our songs off of Walt first, we played it for him, and then he'd say, yeah, that'll work. That was our big praise. Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> and then we had it in the film. But in this case, we didn't have any Walt Disney to tell us. And so we, I remember it was one, one of us said, look, we've got to start depending on ourselves, because we've got to believe in ourselves. It's as simple as that. And I said, this little boy was going through the age of not believing. Oh, yeah, but once you start believing in yourself, then you can do things. So we wrote this little song, and I'm very fond of it. When you rush around in hopeless circles, searching everywhere for something true, you're at the age of not believing when all the make-believe is through. When you set aside your childhood heroes and your dreams are lost upon a shelf, you're at the age of not believing and worst of all, you doubt yourself. You're a castaway where no one hears you on a barren isle in a lonely sea Where did all the happy endings go? Where can all the good times be? You must face the age of not believing Doubting everything you ever knew Until at last you start believing And 
we saw some singular figure back at the end of the park, and one figure was just walking down the road, looking into the windows of the, of the stores. And I said, well, that's all. I mean, let's, let's tell them how much, how much fun we had tonight. So, so we waited for him to come, and he said, oh, we did a little bit. And we were talking for a minute, and I said, well, we just want you to know we had the most wonderful day today. It was just incredible. And at the end, when Tinkerbell was flying across the sky, and the music was playing, and the sky rockets were going on, I just started to cry like a lady, just happy tears, but they were just coming out of my, my eyes. And he said, you know, I do it every time. <laughs> and I just thought, and he said, right there, we're going to go home. We're going to go to the fire station there. And I, I dearly remember that, because he just loved the park. He loved the things in it. He loved what it symbolized. He loved what it meant, you know. There's a, there are happy endings. There's a good world out there. Nice, positive things. He was a very positive man. Mm -hmm. This year happens to be the 50th anniversary of the, the very first song you wrote. In the He thought it was a hobby. He had a thing he was very proud of. And he used to bring the VIPs down to one of the sound stages. And in the corner of this sound stage was a, like a jungle room. And they would come in and they would see this thing that was going on. It was called audio animatronics. You know about them now, but not 50 years ago. And people would see orchids singing and birds, you know, standing on purpose singing. And T. George was going, ho, 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 ho. And all of a sudden, they were in, and they would see this show that they were creating for the Enchanted Tiki Room, and they would say, it, it's great, or well, what the heck is it? You know, <laughs> that's what they would say. And so uh, we were called down one day to this room, and we were sitting on bridge chairs, I remember that, and uh, the show started, and down came this cascade of birds singing, let's all sing like the birdies sing, and we were listening to this thing, and at the end, when, when the rain stopped and everybody was happy again. We said, well, it's great. Well, what is it? <laughs> and he looked right at us and said, you guys are going to write me a song that's going to explain all of this. <laughs> and so uh, we said, uh, yeah, okay, well, well uh, you have to believe. We're going to write lyrics. You have to believe. It's too bad you don't have a parrot. He thought for about a half a second. He said, we won't have one parrot, we'll have four parrots. We'll have a Dutch parrot, we'll have a German parrot, we'll have a Spanish parrot. He was going through a whole conception. And he said, what kind of a song are you going to write? So we looked around and it was kind of a tropical room. as well, a, well, a tropical song of uh, Calypso. So he said, yes, Calypso. And what's it going to be called? Well, Enchanted TV Room is a bit of a, a nothing title. It's a great, good title for the place, but song title, no. But tiki is a great word, and if you're a songwriter and you hear words like tiki, it's kind of good. And so I remember thinking, tiki, 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 yes, it makes sound, tiki, tiki, tiki. Uh, how about we call it the tiki, tiki, tiki room? He says, that's it, when am I going to have a song? <laughs> <laughs> with that, with that, we wrote the following song which we've been playing now for 50 years. Oh, they know this song. I'm sure they'll sing along. <laughs>
And uh, anyhow, he was creating this, this journey into imagination. And he had a fellow called the Gene Finder and a little friend of his called Figment. Now, Figment is a figment of imagination. And we were asked to write a song that would sort of explain what this writer was going to be, this wonderful journey into imagination. And it now it's like the Imagineer's song, because we all have imaginations. And that's what it's all about. It takes one little spark of imagination to make wonderful things happen. And it starts like this. One little spark of inspiration is at the heart of all creation. Right at the start of everything that's new. One little spark lights up for you. Imagination, imagination, a dream. Poppins 
is a song called A Spoonful of Sugar. Right. All right. And in the, uh, in the film, uh, she sings it with a little bird, right. and she sings it again with herself in the mirror. Right. And I think on this song, you might need a little help. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jason Schwartzman and B.J. Nopal. Bye. 
You may think the sweets on the bottom was wrong, though I spent me time in the ashes and smoke in this whole wide world there's no happier look. Up with them, smoke is all bitter and curled. Between pavement and stars, that's the chimney sweeps world. But there's hardly no day and hardly no night. There's things half in shadows and halfway in light.
Well, we could tell them what happened to us when we did that at Disneyland. Oh, we said, well, let's tell them about that. Walt's 100th birthday, this is about 12 years ago, you had produced a show, and we had a lot of the Imagineers came out and did speeches and talked about the projects and things that they created. In the honor of Walt, we were dedicating the wonderful statue by Blaine Gibson of Walt and Mickey. Is that up there? It's and coming up. Oh, there's a picture. Where it's a beautiful partner section. And we were dedicating it. I remember I was asked to do songs that were written for the park. Some of the songs that were written for the park. So I played several things. And at one point, and there were 2,000 people in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the street that day, in the main street. And I was up on the on the right there with a white piano. At one point, I turned around, and there was Walt and Mickey right behind me. I said, folks, this next song is not for, for, you, for you. It's really, I'm doing it for Walt. Uh, this is his song, and I used to like to play this for him. And I proceeded to play Feed the Birds. And I got to the very end of it. Where just talking, talking to the little run of the earth. And one bird out of a cloud in the sky comes swooping right down over where I was playing the piano. Right, and then off again. And there was a, an intake of breath, 2,000 people went, <sighs> like that. And then, and then there was thunderous applause and everything. I said, What did, what was it giving? What happened? I didn't know there was a bird. <laughs> and I came backstage afterwards and I said to Tim, Tim, what happened? And you told me. I said, Walt well, visited us. Walt well, visited us, and I, I thought that was a, a great moment. He said, thank you. I have never thought of the video that had happened until I saw the videotape. And there it was, one bird flew down out of the sky. And one time you told the story, and you said, the bird sat on the piano and waved at me. And I said, that, that's going to the fall. I always feel Walt is with me and he's with all of us in my school. Well, speaking of Walt, let's start out by, by playing out one of Walt's favorite songs. And, and it's a song that you wrote for Walt for an attraction that shows off Walt's great optimism. Oh, so right. let's close with that. He was the futurist of all time, and we, been, we did a song for an attraction called Carousel Progress. <laughs> It goes something like this. Thank you. 
I do not. So when the cat is got your soda, there's no way for it to say, just soda is the word, and then you've got a lot to say. You know, you're going to be careful.